Chapter 23 covers the concept of microevolution, the evolution of populations. Okay, so microevolution is small scale evolution. Evolution um, within a population, so we're not talking about making new species here, we're talking about evolution within a species. And the first thing I want to point out is that individual organisms do not evolve. Populations evolve over time, but an individual, like my dog Dexter here when he was a puppy, cannot evolve. Once you are born, you have the same genes that you'll have when you die. You don't evolve new traits uh, throughout your lifetime. Now, microevolution, like I said, is small-scale evolution. We're looking at changes in allele frequencies. So, in this case, within a population, so a group of organisms of the same species living in a geographic area. So, if you don't remember what a population is, flip back uh, to the uh, first chapter of your book where it shows the biological hierarchy or look it up in the index but a uh, population is a group of the of the same species living in an area and when we look at a change in their allele frequencies over time that is microevolution so in order to understand what that means you need to pull back to your bio one info and remember what an allele is So recall that most organisms are diploid, meaning we have two copies of each chromosome. We often write that as 2n, two copies of each chromosome, one from your mom, one from your dad. And those chromosomes are homologous. So they are similar, they have the same genes, but they may have different alleles for those genes. So different versions of those genes. In the case of Mendel's flowers, he had flowers that had alleles for different flower colors. So same gene, flower color, found at the same locus on that gene. But that gene could be uh, for purple or in this case could also be for white flowers. So the organism with this genotype would be heterozygous for flower color. So this genetic variation is absolutely vital for evolution. We've talked about that before. Without that raw material, evolution can't happen. And in order for evolution to work on a trait, that trait has to be heritable. It must be in the genetic code. Now, when we're looking at traits, or, or I should say characters in this case, certain characters such as white or purple flowers are discrete, discrete characters, meaning you can be one or the other. Whereas other characters are quantitative, meaning more than one gene influences those traits. An example of a quantitative trait is human height. So rather than having just tall and short humans, if we were to graph out a distribution of human height, we would get a nice standard curve. That would indicate that height is controlled by many genes interacting with one another. Now in Bio 1 we talked a lot about mitosis, meiosis. We know that meiosis produces either gametes in the case of animals or spores in the case of plants and we know that it mixes things up it helps to maintain diversity but but it does not change allele frequencies think of it this way if you have a deck of cards let's say your deck of cards has two aces in it and you shuffle the deck of cards you still have two aces at the end of the shuffling it does not add or subtract genes from that uh, or, or, or cards from that deck. The same way meiosis doesn't change the number of genes in the gene pool.
So by gene pool, we're talking about all the genes in a population. So meiosis does not add or subtract genes, so the genes are at the same frequency even if meiosis is making new combinations of genes. However, allele frequencies can change in a population. That's the definition of microevolution. And Hardy Weinberg, the Hardy Weinberg equation, or the Hardy Weinberg equilibrium, is a tool that we use to look and see if evolution is occurring in a population. So, if a population is not evolving, then the frequencies of alleles and the frequency of genotypes will stay the same. Now remember, if you're having trouble remembering what those words are, go back to Bio One Notes or go back to the first part of the book and read up on what genotypes, uh, uh, genotypes are, alleles are, etc. So, if a population is not evolving, allele and genotype frequencies will stay the same over time. So, for example, in generation one of an organism, let's say there's, a, there's two alleles, big A and little a. It'll be, in this case, we have 60% of the alleles are big A, 40% are little a for that particular gene. The next generation, it would be the same, 60-40. That would stay the same over time. That population would be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. It is not evolving. So what Hardy-Weinberg lets you do, so I put it in a bullet here to help you to revisit this and think about it. If you know the allele frequencies in a population, you can then calculate the genotype frequencies, at least what the genotype frequencies should be if the population is not evolving. So if you know allele frequencies, you can then predict what the genotype frequencies would be if the population is not evolving. Okay, so evolution is measured as a change in allele frequencies over time. This equation, the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, allows us to compare genotype frequencies. So we have the, those that we expect to find if there's no evolution happening, and then we go out and we measure what frequencies really are, and we compare the two, what we would expect if evolution is not happening. We compare that to what we really see. And the equation is quite simple. First of all, it always equals 1. I'm just going to say that about 100 times. It always equals 1. If it doesn't equal 1, you did something wrong. It will always equal 1. It doesn't matter if the population is in equilibrium or not. If you did it correctly, it equals 1. So the equation p squared plus 2pq plus q squared equals 1. And basically, we look at alleles and we assign them a letter. We assign them a variable. So one of the alleles, um, for example, if it's a dominant allele, we usually give it the letter p. So p is the frequency of one of the alleles. q is the frequency of the other allele. So remember what a frequency is. That's, that's a, a decimal. It stands for what proportion of the whole that allele accounts for. So it's not just a counted number, it's, it's a proportion. It's a frequency. So if half of the alleles are P and half of them are Q, then the frequency for P is 0 0.5. 50%. Now something that's interesting to note when you're calculating this, so P, remember, is an allele frequency. P squared is a genotype frequency. Because let's say, let's just say that P stands for, I don't know, let's just use uh, big P, purple, like we talked about in bio one. Let's say P stands for big P, purple, and that Q stands for little p, which would be, you know, like white. P squared would stand for big P, big P. Uh, 
Okay. 2PQ stands for big P, little p, and Q squared stands for little p, little p. Maybe a lot to absorb, but work your way through it. Struggle with it a bit. It means you're learning. But that's what those numbers indicate. We can use allele frequencies to calculate what the genotype fre frequencies should be if we are in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Okay, so we can see if evolution is happening. So here is an example. We have a population of circles. And those circles come in different colors. Now, I'm going to use a different nomenclature than we used when we talked about Mendel. Notice, for example, in the yellow circle, we have the color gene. Capital C stands for color gene. And we're going to use the letter Y to indicate which allele we're talking about. So what we have here are, uh, we're going to use examples of codominant alleles. So codominant alleles, or, or, or another way to think about it would be incomplete dominance. If you have a Y allele and you have a blue allele, you're going to appear green because they're both expressed. If you have two blue alleles, you'll be blue. Okay. If you have all Y alleles, you'll be yellow. So incomplete dominance. So the letter, the big letter C stands for the gene, and then the superscript number or letter next to it, in this case Y or B, stands for yellow or blue. So yellow organisms are CYCY, blue organisms are CBCB, and green organisms are CYCB. And we have a population. Now let's look at the total number of organisms in this population. So we need to figure that out and we look and the total number is 10. Okay, so let's look at First, let's determine phenotype frequency. So on the next slide, um, we have this written out for you to go back to, but let's first determine phenotype frequency. So yellow, green, and blue. So phenotype frequencies, that's another bio one word that you should know. So let's turn this into frequency. So yellow, there are three of them. There are three out of 10. That would be 0 0.3. Green of them, there are one, two, three, four out of 10. That's 0 0.4. And how many blue? There's one, two, three out of 10. Okay. So those are the phenotype frequencies. 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and 0.3. Just like I have on the next slide. So the question I ask is, is this population evolving? So is it or is it not in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium? So we know that the phenotype distribution, therefore in this case we also know the genotype distribution, it's the same, right? So Yellow is um, CY, CY. Green is CY, CB. And blue is CB, CB. All right. So we know the genotype frequencies. We know the allele frequencies. 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.3. Now we need to, to figure out the allele frequencies. So we're talking about... P, we're talking about Q in that Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. That's a pretty bad Q. Let me fix that. Whoop. All right, good enough. All right, so the proportion of P and the proportion of Q. So we know we have 10 individuals. Let me step back to the other slide. 
We know we have 10 individuals and each one is diploid. Because we have 10 individuals, we know that we have, for this gene, we have a total number uh, of, uh, what, 20? Because there's two color alleles in each of those organisms. There's two color alleles in each organism, and because there are 10 organisms, that means there is a total number of 20. So when I say number 20, I'm just saying there's 20 color genes in this population. Now let's figure out how many of those color genes are yellow. So, for every yellow organism, there are two yellow color genes. So that means that we have two, four, six accounted for there. Six yellow color genes in yellow organisms. And every green organism has one yellow allele. So, let's figure that out. There's two, four, six in the yellow. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten total uh, yellow alleles. So, there's 20 total alleles, and yellow counts for half of them, so that would be 0 0.5. That is the frequency of yellow alleles. Now, let's double check the number of blue alleles. How many blue alleles are there in a yellow organism? Zero. How many blue alleles are there in a blue organism? Two. How many blue do we see here? One, two, three. So those are six total blue alleles that are accounted for six alleles and there are one, two, three, four uh, of, of the uh, green. So each of those has one blue allele. So four plus six is ten. And once again, that's half the number of total genes in this population. So that would mean half of those are blue. 0 0.5. So in this hypothetical population, for this gene, of color, half of the alleles are yellow, half of the alleles are blue. So now what we do is we take those numbers that we know from the population and we run them through Hardy-Weinberg and we're going to compare the numbers that we have up here, the, the genotype or phenotype frequencies up here, we're going to compare those to what we should have if the population is not evolving. So we take P squared, so that's 0 0.5 squared, plus 2 times, put a parenthesis here, P times Q, that's 0 0.5, times 0 0.5, plus Q squared, and Q is 0 0.5 squared, and that will equal 1. So what we do is we simply simplify this. So what is 0.5 squared? Well, that is 0 0.25 plus 0.5 times 0.5 is 0.25 times 2, 0 0.5 plus 0.5 times two, or 0.5 squared is 0 0.25, and that will all equal 1. Okay, so whoop-de-doo, now what? Well, compare what you've done here at the bottom of the screen. Compare this to the numbers that we have up here. These are the actual numbers. These are the predicted numbers that we should have if the population is not evolving. So. 25% of the population should be CY, CY. 50% of the population should be CY, CB. And 25% of the population should be CB, CB. Is that what we see? No, it is not. Therefore, we know with simple math that evolution is happening and this population is evolving. This population does not have the predicted allele frequencies that it, that it would have if it were not evolving. So, 
you're going to want to run different numbers through that Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium to get a hang, uh, hang of it, and I will have a worksheet in class. But what would keep, let's, let's move on from the math and talk about conceptually, what would stop a population from evolving? How, in reality, you know, it's funny when people think evolution doesn't happen because in reality, it's almost impossible to stop evolution from happening. But what could we do to keep it from happening? Well, we need a number of things to hold true for a population to stay in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. First of all, to stay in equilibrium, we have to have no mutations. That would change allele frequencies. We cannot have mutations in a population. Secondly, all of the organisms in the population have to be equally likely to have babies with one another. Random mating. You can't have yellow organisms always having babies with other yellow organisms because that will make yellow more common. But if yellow is just as likely to have babies with green as it is with blue, you maintain equal allele frequencies. There can be no natural selection. So being green cannot be an advantage in this habitat, right? Or being yellow cannot be advantageous. Everyone has the same chance of surviving. Everyone has the same chance of reproducing. So no natural selection is necessary to maintain Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. You cannot have genetic drift. Now genetic drift is when a small, usually a small population experiences random allele frequency changes. Think of a boat that's drifting at sea, it's random. You also cannot have gene flow. Gene flow is when genes migrate into or out of your population. So organisms come in from somewhere else and have babies with your population. Or someone from your population leaves and goes to a new population. That's gene flow. Some mutations, we've talked about those in Bio 1. We talked about silent mutations and nonsense mutations and things like that. That's where new variation comes from. And that's where allele frequencies, one of the ways allele frequencies can change. Uh, allele frequencies can change because brand new alleles can show up, or a red flower might turn to a, uh, might have offspring that are now white because of a mutation. Um, mutations arise when genes are copied, you get extra copies of genes, or when genes are copied incorrectly and you get uh, rearranged genes. So that's where mutations can arise. Usually mutations are bad, but remember, sometimes they don't have any effect at all, like a silent mutation, and other times they can be beneficial. Now when I said the random mating, every member of a population has to have an equal chance of breeding if you're going to stop evolution. So everyone in a population has an equal chance of breeding with anyone else in the population. and. Um, one thing that that does for a population is it reduces the chances of inbreeding because a lot of times organisms tend to mate with organisms that are like themselves, which means they tend to mate with those that are a little bit more closely related to them, which can be a problem. So random mating can be a good thing and it also slows down evolution. Just to show you why random mating can be somewhat good for a population, um, imagine if uh, you have a recessive trait, so you have a, a gene for the letter R, whatever R stands for, some kind of a trait, but a little, little case R is a recessive disease uh, causing allele. So if you have two copies of little r, you have the disease. So big R, little r means you are a carrier for that disease, but you don't show the traits. So you are heterozygous for that trait, your spouse is homozygous dominant for that trait, and you have babies. Half of your offsprings, uh, offspring will be big R, big R, half will be big R, little r, but no one will have the disease. But let's say instead you marry your cousin, and your cousin is also a carrier for that disease because they're closely related to you. So you're both big R, little r. Now 
half of your offspring, I'm sorry, not half, but a quarter of your offspring will be homozygous dominant. Half of them will be heterozygous, but a quarter of them will be homozygous recessive, meaning they have the disease. Just an example of this, uh, there was a place in Kentucky where this family lived that had a condition that uh, meant their, their hemoglobin didn't carry oxygen very well, and therefore their skin appeared blue. And they had lived in that same area for generations, and there was a lot of inbreeding in the family. They had a lot of homozygosity in the family, and we can actually trace it uh, through the generations and say, huh, uh, you know, uh, one in four of their offspring would be blue, basically. And we can see that in old family portraits of the family, where certain, uh, you know, parents and grandparents and, and children, uh, certain proportions of the family actually had this blue condition. Okay, so we have to have random mating if we're going to stop evolution because it changes predicted allele frequencies. You have to have everyone having an equal chance having babies with each other if, if you're going to stop evolution. So if you're inbreeding, that causes a shift in allele frequencies, a form of microevolution. Um, now another thing, we mentioned gene flow. Genes flow from one population to another due to migration or immigration, things like that. Organisms move from one place to another. That's gene flow. That will change allele frequencies in that population because suddenly new alleles show up. So in this example, we have an original population of 20 blue to 10 red. Meanwhile, in the other population, we had 10 blue to 20 red. And you get organisms moving from one population to the other. It will change the proportions of the members of that population. Another thing we cannot have, so if we're going to keep our population from evolving, we cannot have genetic drift. And genetic drift, as I said, is random. How allele frequencies fluctuate unpredictably from one generation to the next. And the best way to prevent genetic drift is to have a large population. So a big sample size, basically. So if you randomly breed different individuals together, you don't cause one allele to become more common over another, for example. One example of a type of genetic drift is known as the founder effect. The founder effect is when a portion of a population randomly randomly leaves and forms a new population. So not exactly um, gene flow, they're not moving to another population, they start a new population. So let's say um, in the case of an island, some, some birds blow off from the, Galapag or from the mainland and form a new population on the Galapagos. That's a type of drift because the new population may actually show a slightly different allele frequency from the original population. For example, in the original population, you had 20 pink to 10 red, so a 2 to 1 ratio of pink to red but if you randomly draw that circle there and you, it, let's say those organisms that are circled move to a new population, that new population is one pink to three red. So it does not rec represent the original population in terms of its allele frequencies. We also see um, a similar thing in certain populations of Mennonites or Amish in Pennsylvania. Um, at least historically there was a group that were all related to each other more or less. They all had a, a similar ancestor who moved to America and had babies and this village was all related to that one guy and he happened to have an extra finger on one hand. So everyone, almost, not maybe not everyone, but most of the people that were in that village had an extra finger on their hand. That's genetic drift, that's the founder effect. They have that trait because one individual in their past had that trait and passed it on. 
but that trait did not represent the rest of the population. It did not represent the population he moved from. There was hardly anybody in Europe with an extra finger, just him. But because he moved and founded a new population, that new population has that unique trait. Another example are starlings. Starlings are a bird from uh, Great Britain, and uh, you know, uh, and where where Shakespeare was from. And some individuals back in the 17 or 1800s decided it would be nice if we had all of the birds in America that Shakespeare wrote about in his plays. So they released about 20 or so starlings, which now formed giant populations in the United States, a, a huge pest in the United States. They're everywhere around Conway, not a native species. All of them are somewhat closely related because they were, they're all related to that original small group that was released in New York back, uh, you know, over a hundred years ago. Another type of genetic drift is the bottleneck effect, so random changes to a population. Organisms that randomly survive or that randomly migrate to form new populations. So the bottleneck effect is when you have a, a big population but rather than one or two moving away and forming a new population, only one or two survive after a near extinction event. Almost everyone dies except for a few, and those few happen to be of a certain allele type or genotype. So in this original example, we have some wild, wild boar, um, some wild pigs, uh, and we see for whatever this trait is, we see big B, big B, little B, little B, big B, little B, and, you know, quite a diverse group. But after this event occurs, it just so happens that only little B, little B pigs remain. It's not because of natural selection. It's not like little B, little B was an advantage. It's just that they happen to survive. And now every pig in that population will be little B, little B. We also see similar... Um, situations in, in uh, animals that have nearly gone extinct. We see a loss of their genetic diversity and all of the survivors have, have much less diversity than the original population had. So bottleneck effect, you have an original population with a lot of diversity. You can see white individuals, blue individuals, and yellow individuals, but only a few survive some sort of a cataclysm like overhunting or, or a hurricane or whatever it is, and the surviving population does not represent the same frequencies of alleles as the original population. That's microevolution. Okay, so I also want to mention that uh, natural selection, of course, cannot happen if you don't want evolution to happen. And natural selection includes surviving, but it also includes reproduction. Uh, without reproduction, it doesn't matter, right? And when it comes to reproduction, it's not just whether or not you can survive to reproduce. It's whether or not you get a chance to find a mate. And we call this type of natural selection sexual selection. And there's two types of sexual selection I want to mention. We're all familiar with these, but we're going to learn the words for them. Intrasexual selection is when members of the same sex compete for a mate. So that's when you get deer fighting, right? Competing with one another, fighting over a mate. So the males usually fight for a female. Intersexual selection is when usually a female gets to choose which male she will mate with. And that leads to sexual dimorphism. That female choice causes over time evolution to happen and males to get more and more, in the case of the wood duck, more and more showy, more and more colorful because females like that and so the males that have that have more babies and that drives that selection to, for males becoming more and more colorful and uh, feathery and things like that. We see that in the peacock. So the peacock has this huge plume of feathers that attracts a mate 
but it also makes him more vulnerable to predators. So he has to mate while he can before before he gets old and eaten. So natural selection can lead to adaptation to an environment. And remember without it, if you don't have natural selection, you might not evolve. Uh, but you can evolve without it, but it is one of those things that will definitely cause a population to change. Now natural selection, as we said already, does not make new alleles. It edits already existing traits. And we've already heard this term survival of the fit of the fittest. Fitness in this case does not mean strong. It means you are able to survive, you are able to have babies. That is what fitness means when we talk about evolution. So there are different ways natural selection will affect a population depending on who survives and who doesn't. Three types, directional selection, disruptive selection, and stabilizing selection. It just depends on the population. And, and their original diversity and what's favorable in a certain circumstance. So let's say we have mice. Or, or we have an original population at the top of the screen. We have mice of different colors. White, slightly brown, more brown, even more brown, and then blackish uh, at the end there. So the, uh, we have black mice and white mice and brown mice in between. And we have a histogram here. A histogram shows us, look at the y-axis, the frequency of individuals, how many of them are there. And then the x-axis is what color the mice are. So we can see that the average color of a mouse in this population is kind of a, a light middle brown. And black mice are very rare and white mice are very rare. So there are three types, three modes of natural selection. Directional selection is when one of the extreme ends of the original distribution becomes more common. So let's say the habitat changes, the climate changes, and there's more and more plants that, that provide shade, and being a darker color means you can hide better. So the light-colored mice kind of go away, and darker colored mice become much more common. In the case of disruptive selection, this is one of the types of natural selection that might push a species towards speciation. We have the extreme ends on both sides of the original distribution becoming more common. So perhaps the vegetation becomes taller and thicker, but right across the, the stream or right across the field, there's a habitat where white mice can hide really well. But if you're in between white or black, you can't hide very well. So then what used to be average goes away. So in disruptive selection, what used to be average becomes less common and the extremes become more common. So both white and black mice become more common. The last kind of selection is when you get rid of everything but the average. Uh, this, is, this is going to make a population very well adapted to a particular environment. And that's stabilizing selection. So in this case, both the white and the black mice kind of go away. And the average brown mouse is what we're left with in terms of diversity. So natural selection weeds out the, the colorations or the, the phenotypes that don't work in that habitat. So directional selection, one of the extreme ends becomes more common over time. Disruptive selection, what once was average, becomes rare and the extremes become more common, both extremes in this case. And stabilizing selection. The extremes both go away and average becomes almost the entire population. So I have an example here for you to think about. You can read this on your own. 
and come up with an answer. And in the same situation, what would happen if to a population of mice that live on a forest floor, um, there's a light colored and a dark colored phenotype, just like the population we saw in the previous slides. What would happen if the, the habitat turned purple? What would happen to that population if they turned purple? The, the, the habitat, not the mice. So the habitat turns purple. How would the mouse population respond? We'll, we'll bring that up in class. So natural selection removes non-useful phenotypes. We saw that, like with stabilizing selection. We lost most of our diversity. When I, but we don't know what genotypes are still left. We know that the phenotypes that are remaining are you know, brown mice. So how can we maintain genetic diversity if stabilizing selection makes a population more and more adapted to its environment? Well, first of all, some variation does not have a selective advantage. We call that neutral variation, like whether or not your earlobes are attached or not. So neutral variation allows for variation in a population that does not affect fitness. But more to the point, we need to bear in mind that organisms are mostly, at least animals, are mostly diploid. And natural selection only acts on phenotypes. So it acts on what you look like, what you are, what gene, what, or what uh, proteins you're producing, what color you are, things like that. It acts on that. It, it, it doesn't act on your genes directly. So in the case of, for example, before we looked at this population here, let's go back for just a second. This, popu this population right here is very well adapted to its environment, but most of the phenotypic diversity is gone. But that doesn't mean that all of the genetic diversity is necessarily gone. Because some organisms in that popula population might be carriers for the other colors. So sometimes, you know, they can hang on to big A, little a. Like, let's say being white was a little a. Well, a brown mouse might be big A, little a. Or if it's a co-dominant thing, they could, they could carry white or they could carry black and still be somewhat brown, right? So they can, they can still have some of those genes in the population, even though most of the population is brown, thanks to, to uh, the diploid nature of animals. And occasionally, being heterozygous for a gene at a particular locus has a greater uh, advantage uh, in, in, in for that organism. For example, we've talked a lot in Bio 1 about sickle cell anemia. If you live near the equator in an area with malaria, being heterozygous for sickle cell, being a carrier of sickle cell, but not having full-blown sickle cell, so being heterozygous for the sickle cell trait is an advantage because it lets you remove malaria from your bloodstream more easily than someone without that trait. So if you have full-on sickle cell, uh, you're, you're homozygous for sickle cell, it's bad. Your capillaries get clogged up, you have high instances of stroke and things like that. But if you are a carrier for sickle cell and you live in one of these areas uh, near the equator where there's a lot of malaria, caused by a organism known as a plasmodium. It's a uh, unicellular, unicellular eukaryote. We'll talk about it a little bit later. If you live there and you have one sickle cell allele, the cells that get infected by malaria will actually go sickle-shaped and your spleen can destroy them, destroying the malaria. So, so being a heterozygote in that circumstance is an advantage. Okay, that's enough of that. I will see you in lecture.